welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is the reproductive system. So, we talked last time about the male reproductive system, so let's do a quick recap of the important parts from there. Both reproductive systems are controlled by the hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis, or the HPG axis. So the HPG axis in males starts up here in the hypothalamus, where we have these neurons that produce the releasing hormone GnRH, the gonadotropin releasing hormone. So this name tells you exactly what it does. It stimulates the release of gonadotropins. The gonadotropins are these two hormones, FSH and LH. So gonadotropins are two hormones that come from the anterior pituitary, FSH and LH. So those are the gonadotropic hormones, and their release is stimulated by the gonadotropin releasing hormone. So, all right, well, what cells are targets for gonadotropin releasing hormone? The only cells that would be targets for gonadotropin releasing hormone are those in the anterior pituitary that contain receptors for it. So we have a lot of cells in here with receptors for various release and release inhibiting hormones. So they're all But the only ones with GnRH receptors are what cells? The gonadotropes. So gonadotropes. And what they have are GnRH receptors. So that makes them a target for GnRH. Now recall, our anterior pituitary is not directly physically connected to the hypothalamus. It's connected to the hypothalamus through the hypothalamo-hypothesial portal system, this blood vessel network. So what happens is GnRH is stimulated to be released into this region called the median eminence that is in this part here called the infundibulum, which is the stalk of the pituitary. So GnRH is released into there. It will enter the portal veins and pool in secondary plexus capillaries. It will bind to GnRH receptors. And when it binds to those receptors, it's going to stimulate the release of our gonadotropins, FSH and LH. Okay, FSH and LH, what are their targets? FSH is going to enter the body and go to the gonads. In the male, the gonads are the testes. So FSH is going to go to the testes specifically and stimulate the targets in the testes that have FSH receptors. Which cells have FSH receptors? Sustentacular cells, Sertoli cells, nerve cells, systemocytes. Those are all different names for the same cells that contain FSH receptors. And so FSH is going to go to the testes. The, the word I'm going to use is my nerve cell. And my nerve cells are going to stimulate a couple things. The name I'm going to use today is systemocyte. And when FSH binds to its extracellular receptor, it's going to do several things for the cell. It's going to stimulate nurturing of our developing uh, spermatocytes. It's going to stimulate androgen binding protein production. And it's going to stimulate inhibin production. So inhibin is going to enter the blood and it's actually going to selectively negatively feed back on gonadotropes by binding inhibit receptors. And when it does that, it's going to inhibit FSH release. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. Okay, LH enters the blood and is going to stimulate the other cells that are important in the testes. These are the ones that are between the seminiferous tubules called the interstitial endocrine cells or the Leydig cells. I'll probably write Leydig cells because it's easier. So LH enters the blood and goes to the testes, and it's going to bind to its targets. The only cells in the testes with LH receptors are our Leydig cells. And what's going to happen here is we're going to stimulate them to produce testosterone, produce and release testosterone. OK, so testosterone is important for lots of things. One of the things that it's important for is spermatogenesis or the ability to make little spermatids. So in order for test testosterone to stimulate that, it's got to stay high in the testis, and it's able to stay high in the testis because androgen binding proteins 
protein binds to it and keeps it high there. More testosterone is going to enter the blood and stimulate all of the other things that testosterone stimulates. The development of secondary sex characteristics, all of our male behavioral characteristics, all of the things that we associate with being male are going to be stimulated by testosterone and another androgen, 5-DHT. Uh, but basically, we're only going to talk about testosterone. One of the things that's going to happen is the hypothalamus is going to be paying attention to these levels of testosterone in the blood. And so, so since what we're paying attention to is the level of testosterone in the blood, what kind of regulation then is the hypothalamus under as far as the levels of testosterone are concerned? Hormonal, humoral, or neural? Humoral, because what the hypothalamus is paying attention to is something in the blood. So either high levels of testosterone or low levels of testosterone. If we're in homeostasis, we're good, but it's negative feedback. So let's just think about it both ways for a minute. Let's imagine that testosterone goes low. What are we going to do to GnRH release? We'll stimulate it, so we'll get more GnRH. If GnRH goes up, then we'll stimulate our gonadotropes, so we'll have more FSH and more LH, so that we can get more testosterone and come back to homeostasis. Okay, well, what about if testosterone goes too high? If testosterone goes too high, then you would stop GnRH release, which would stop stimulation of our gonadotropes, so we would lower FSH and LH release, and we would lower testosterone release to come back to homeostasis. Okay, so what about this inhibin thing? What is that about? Why does that matter? Why would we want to selectively inhibit FSH release? So FSH is really going to be responsible for stimulating sperm production. And so if you're in a situation where you don't necessarily need to be producing sperm, you still need to be able to release testosterone. So how can I make sure to keep sperm count in homeostatic levels for whatever's going on, while also keeping testosterone levels in homeostatic range? This is kind of a weird example, but it kind of helps, I think, to wrap your head around it. What if you're a monk? If you're a monk in a monastery, you really are not using a lot of Thing because you're just not so you but you're still male so you still need to have all of the effects of testosterone so what we can do there then is by stimulating our gonadotropes and then setting up this selective negative feedback loop where FSH gets inhibited but LH can still go up we can make sure to keep testosterone in homeostatic range without having sperm count go up necessarily I mean, the inverse could also be true. You could be a guy who needs to make sperm all the time. So, I don't know, like a porn star. And so, if that's the case, then uh, you're still going to set up this negative feedback loop because when FSH binds to our systemocytes, they do produce inhibin, but it's not going to drop sperm production so low that you wouldn't have enough to make ejaculate. If you think about it, if you're a porn star, you probably need a lot of testosterone too. So, uh, that's just some information for your back pocket. Let's talk about the female reproductive system. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is female anatomy. We'll leave female physiology for next class. And so, if you recall, we said our reproductive systems had primary sex organs and secondary sex organs, or our primary sex organs and all the accessories. Our primary sex organs are directly involved in reproduction by producing our gametes and our sex hormones. Females are gonads or the ovaries. So our ovaries are going to produce the gametes, oocytes, and the sex hormones, estrogen, which is uh, estradiol in humans, abbreviated E2, and progesterone, which is abbreviated P4. So I'm going to use these abbreviations from now on. Uh, E2 is estradiol, is its chemical name, that's our estrogen, and progesterone is P4. So those are our primary sex organs. All right, and then as far as internal and external genitalia in the female go, our tube system in the female starts with the tubes that lead away from the gonads, the uterine tubes or fallopian tubes, and they're going to continue away from the ovaries in through to the uterus. The uterus has 
different parts. You look at in lab, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, the uterus then leads into the vagina, and that's all of the tube system. Females have some glands as well, not as many as males, but they've got what are called uh, vestibular, greater vestibular glands uh, that empty onto the external genitalia that are similar to vulva urethra glands. And they have another gland called the skein gland that's similar to the prostate gland, but nobody ever talks about that. I don't even think you can find it in your book. Okay, so as far as internal genitalia goes, that's everything that we could see on the inside. So when thinking about genitalia, it's important that you always wear a protection. So female external genitalia has some superficial structures and then when you remove this top layer of skin there are some deeper structures. What we can see superficially is the orifice to the vagina. This pink region here is called the vestibule. This is the crevice of the clitoris and the glands of the clitoris is right here. If we were to pull this away we can see the body of the clitoris deep to that. The clitoris is the female erectile body that engorges with blood during the arousal phase of the female sexual response. Other things that we can see here are the labia minora and the labia majora. So this lighter pink is the labia minora and labia majora out here. There would be mons pubis out here is an extra layer of subcutaneous adipose that uh, females have above the pubis bone. Um, other things to be aware of, so this vestibule region leads into the vagina and if we were to pull these structures away, the other internal structures that we would see other than the uh, body of the torus are the vestibular glands. So we would see the bulb of the greater vestibular glands and the vestibular glands that empty onto the, uh, into the vaginal orifice to lubricate the vagina during the arousal phase of the female sexual response.